Is there a silent killer in your walls? Water may seem harmless, but even just a little bit continuously coming into your building can lead to rot, mold, and even serious structural problems. Hey, I'm Josh, a builder here in New Zealand, and I've teamed up with BCITO to better explain the building process. In this video here today, we're gonna to talk about how water penetrates buildings, also some of the things we do as builders to prevent that penetration, and stick around to the end of the video where we touch on the leaky home crisis of the 90s and early 2000s in New Zealand. The leaky home building saga cost New Zealand over $20 billion. First up, let's talk about penetration, and I'm meaning water penetrating your structure. There's five main ways, and they are gravity, surface tension, pressure, capillary action, and water vapor. Let's start with gravity. In simple terms, gravity drags something from the top down. So think about water, it's gonna go from the roof downwards and whatever it hits along the way is gonna affect the flow path of that water. Quite a proportion of building leaks are caused by straightforward design or construction shortcomings that permit water to enter and run downwards pulled by gravity. Number two, surface tension in water. The tendency of water to form beads is caused by molecular properties and is known as surface tension. When a bead or a drop of water is in contact with a surface, it is attracted to that surface and the attraction may be so strong that it can counteract gravity. Hence, drops of rain hang underneath a sill. The water is just sitting there and gravity is fighting it, trying to drop it, but surface tension means that that drop sits there clinging to the surface. Have a look around next time it rains. Look up, look at all the beads of water. It's like an invisible glue holding it there. Number three, pressure and water. Where wind blows against a wall, it increases the pressure on the outside compared with the lower interior pressure. The natural process of equalizing the pressure means that air moves through the gaps in the wall, and if there's any water present, such as rainwater, it carries water with it. Basically, air is always trying to equalize in high pressure here, low pressure here, and it sucks in to fill the void, and as it's sucking in, it pulls the water with it. Number four, capillary action. Capillary action relies on surface tension. When the surface tension is holding the water between two surfaces that are really close together, the attraction pulls the water along and is so strong that it's capable of moving water against gravity. Even crazier is that the narrower the gap, the stronger the attraction and the further the water can move. Layman terms, We've got water sitting here and its surface tension is stuck on, it's not moving. And then we've got a tiny little gap here and this gap can like suck it through like a straw and it's fighting gravity. And the last thing is water vapor. Water vapor is formed where volumes of air are different temperatures and the vapor is most likely trying to move from the interior to the exterior. So opposite to air pressure, you've got this warm, moist air on the inside, which is produced from people living, eating, breathing, and you've got this cold air on the outside, and then this warm air with this vapor in it hits this cold surface and then converts that vapor into a liquid, and then that's your condensation running down your windows. That, folks, is the five ways that water can destroy your building. Guys, it's working. 25% of you are now subscribed. But what the heck are the other 75% up to? While we keep pushing water out, how about we get more of you in on going ahead and clicking subscribe? It really does help us make videos like this. Now that we know how water gets into your building, we can talk about how it affects your building if it goes on continuously and unchecked. Let's start with mold growth. Moisture creates mold, especially in areas that are a little bit dark or damp or don't get touched, especially if it's on the inside of a wall that's never ever going to dry up. That, folks, is a breeding ground for mold and that's gross. Not only does it produce mold, but most building materials are not designed to be continuously wet. And so if your framing or your weatherboard or your jib lining is continuously 
getting moisture into it, it is going to break down. It's gonna lose its structural integrity, it's gonna lose its visual integrity, and it's not gonna do the job it was designed for. And in extreme cases, it can rot and collapse, which is not great. We build buildings to last forever, so we need to keep water out. But most of all, if you are living in a damp, moist, moldy home, that's also not structurally stable, you're not gonna have a good type. Poor inadequate air quality inside can not only lead to respiratory issues, which leads to a lesser quality of life. And that's not fun for anyone. We make buildings to protect ourselves from the elements. We make them to be our safe haven. And good design prevents water penetration. Some key design elements include slopes, making sure that angled surfaces run away from the building instead of pooling. Drip grooves, these are small indentations that stop water from running back into a surface. Overlaps, layering materials directs water away from vulnerable areas. Weather grooves, much like drip grooves, are gaps designed to stop water from getting inside. And seals, rubber or other materials that block water from entering joints. All these things are counteracting the five ways that water gets into buildings. When a building is being designed, there are four Ds in relation to weather tightness. I'm talking deflection, drying, drainage, and durability. Let's talk about those four Ds in more detail. Deflection is all about keeping water away from the building, and this is the first line of defense. This includes things like sloping surfaces, like a good classic roof. Not only does that roof slope away from the building, it has an overhang such as an eave or a veranda. On top of this, we also use flashings to divert water from one path to another. And lastly, our cladding and our cladding system and the finishes on top of that cladding all work to deflect water away from the building. Basically, you're keeping the water on the outside and all the stuff on the inside nice and warm and dry. The next D is drainage. Some water inevitably finds its way past the first line of defense set up to deflect it. The quickest way to get rid of that water is by designing pathways for the water to drain back out. This is the key principle behind the cavity system for installing exterior cladding. The cavity is normally constructed from vertical battens which leave a space of about 20 mils between the cladding and the wall framing. A perforated strip at the base of each wall allows water to easily drain away. Basically look at it like this, if the water does end up behind the cladding for some reason, there's a 20 mil gap and a barrier and the water should go down that before it gets into the building. The next D is drying. Drying is all about airflow. Once water that has penetrated a structure has drained out, the residue that remains on the surface needs to dry up. In the case of cavity systems, the same perforated strip that allows for drainage also encourages the movement of air between the cladding and the framing. This movement contributes to the evaporation. So look at it this way, the cavity is not just for water to go down, but it's for air flow to come through. That air flow, as it moves, it picks up the moisture that's been left behind on surfaces and dries it out. And the last D is all about durability. The materials and fixings used in the construction of exterior walls must be able to resist the effects of being wet some or most of the time and continue to perform as intended even when they've been wet. This is most commonly dealt with by the designer meeting the minimum requirements. Some examples of this, timber in vulnerable positions are treated against rock, steel flashings and fixings are protected by galvanizing or another treatment, and then some relatively stable materials such as aluminiums and plastics are used for key flashing components. Basically you got to use the right materials for the job and you got to make sure it stands the test of time. So now that you understand all of that, let's talk about what went wrong in the late 90s and early 2000s. What is leaky home syndrome is something that plagued New Zealand. Basically it came together through a combination of factors in the 90s and started to affect building owners in the early 2000s as framing timber decayed and failed causing unhealthy environments and at worst structurally unsafe buildings. The situation resulted in an avalanche of legal battles against builders building suppliers and local councils. On top of this, there's been a raft of expensive remedial work. 
I vividly remember working on one site where we put a tent over the building and we pulled almost all of the exterior framing off right back to bottom plates and piece by piece we had to rebuild that home. That was someone's home who was living in there. That was a massively intrusive process for the homeowner and that was just one of many buildings in the Wellington Hills that had to go through this process. There is a lot of disagreement about what actually caused leaky home syndrome and I'm just a builder here on the ground doing my thing. But if I was going to sum it up in four points, it would be that a new building act came into effect in 1994, making construction way less regulated. On top of that, the building apprenticeship system was abolished in 1991 and it took some years before the ITOs, shout out BCITO, came back in with a systematic training approach. In 1995, the standard approach for treating timber was changed and you were allowed to start building with untreated Pinus radiata. That's crazy if you chop a pine tree down and leave it on the ground within a year it starts to rot on top of all that the mediterranean look came into fashion think stucco buildings with lots of flat roofs with lots of membranes this meant the water hit the roof ran down the sides and penetrated the building in lots of different ways and some people would argue that the majority of sheet type claddings were not sufficient these things created a perfect storm that led to a leaky home syndrome across the nation in 2004, the government stepped in and put a new building regulation in place. They tightened up the regulations for things like timber treatment, and they really honed in on the design principles and the four Ds. Then now is a risk matrix. When you're designing a building, you have to go out of your way to make a building low risk. By 2015, most estimates were that the leaky home building saga cost New Zealand over $20 billion. It might be a silent killer, but it doesn't have to be scary. With good design and good workmanship, you can keep water out of your building. Yo, sign up squad, you've made it to the end of the video. First up, thanks for watching all the way through and I hope it gives you a better understanding of some of the components in your building. Massive shout out to BCITO. If you know someone in your life that's thinking of doing a construction apprenticeship, the first thing I'd recommend they do is go and find a way to do a trial on site. Don't quit your job or drop out of school all of a sudden until you're given it a try on site. And you might be like me and you might fall in love with it on day one, or you might realize after a month, you know what, it's not for me. Either way, it's not a failure. Find a way to give it a go, offer to go and help a builder out, even if you offer to sweep the floors for free. Get yourself on site, get yourself around some tradies, and check out BCITO.